Test one, two, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to welcome you here today for the second talk in this series. Attendance last week was 71 people, six people watched it online, and so far about 80 people have watched it further down the line, so it's right up there with our best um, occupancy rates for the whole time. You guys provide a really good audience, these are, these are well worth doing. So today's talk's also being streamed live and there's the, the, it's online so you can go and have a look at it afterwards if you want to. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, um, drop me an email and I'll, and I'll send it straight back to you. The condition for us using the space we are conforming to, we've got a maximum of 100 people, spaced, masked and scanned in. Thank you very much for your cooperation. If you need toilets, out that dweller, either way you will find a toilet sign. In the event of an emergency, same thing, out the back door, go either way the car and assemble in the car parks at, at each end. Um, due to COVID restrictions, there'll be no afternoon tea today. But if you have a question that comes up during the talk, keep it in mind because what we'll do, like we did last week, is, is if you put your hand up at question time, somebody will bring you a microphone so that you can, um, everybody in the room can hear it and also the people that are watching online. So our speaker today is... Jane Code. Now, Jane's a former professor in food science and technology at the School of Food and Nutrition in, at Massey University. Jane's a bit of a veteran U3A presenter. She was here on the last series, so you probably would have run into her until, uh, on that. Until recently, Jane was a professor of nutrition at Massey and the head of nu nutrition science group in the College of Sciences. Three months today, ago today, she joined our ranks of the great retired. So welcome, Jane. So Jane's still got an honorary contract with the university and she's continuing to work on research projects, supervising students and applying for research funds. Might talk to you later about that. Her major research interests have been related to iron, vitamin D, body composition and bone, and more recently gut microbiota biotica, and dietary patterns. She's got a PhD from the University of London and some 120 publications to her credit. The topic today is healthy ageing and nutrition. And she says, nutrition plays an important role in the healthy ageing. However, older people can be at increased risk of malnutrition. This presentation will examine recent research findings related to the changing nutritional, nutritional requirements with age, focusing on protein, micronutrients such as iron, calcium, vitamin D and vitamin B12. Without any further ado, it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Jane Crowd. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Kia ora Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you again. Um, uh, it was a great delight last time, particularly uh, for the questions. Um, and I guess this talk stems in the questions that I didn't answer um, with the last presentation and talking a little bit more about personal nutrition rather than nutrition for the planet. Um, and so there was a lady in the front row who was particularly good at asking questions that I had not addressed um, about nutrition in, uh, in my presentation. So... Uh, <laughs> Healthy ageing, the, the importance of nutrition is increasing. The WHO estimates that the global portion of adults over 65 will increase to 16% by 2050. So that takes them um, above the number of five-year-olds or children under five. Um, and nutrition is one of the few things that we can modify and change and be in control of. Uh, so I will um, start, I think, by talking about ageing generally, the physiology of ageing, the things that nutritionists need to take into account um, when they consider nutritional advice. So the first thing is, ageing is not 
even. Um, it's very heterogeneous. And the WHO split uh, the ageing population into the young old, the middle old, the old old. And from a research perspective, we also look at centenarians who are over 100 and see what they're doing and what they're eating and what they had eaten for the last century to try and determine what is good advice. And we're now moving on to look at super centenarians, uh, people who are over 110. And by the time we look at those, you'll appreciate that a number of those people have got children who are in their 80s or 90s and grandchildren who are in their 60s or 70s. And so it's quite a different profile um, than we're used to looking at. So it's difficult to generalise about uh, changes with ageing, uh, but there are some general characteristics. The first is that body composition changes, and I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail because the changes in uh, muscle mass and bone composition are particularly important when we consider maintaining independence and keeping mobility. Um, there's a drop in metabolic rate, um, and uh, there are changes in appetite. Um, and so sometimes it's really difficult to make recommendations because people are eating uh, quite a small amount of food compared to what they'd eaten before uh, when they were more active. Um, there are also changes in sensory perception, and that kind of relates to appetite. And so that if food tastes different or not as pleasant, it's quite difficult to maintain adequate food intake. Um, and then as people get older, they're more likely to take a prescribed uh, medicine. And so 90% um, of older people will have one or more prescribed medications. And by the time we get to uh, looking at uh, increased proportions of prescriptions, there's around about a third of older people who have five or more prescribed medications. And that has an impact on nutrition. And that's partly because the number of nutrients and um, prescribed drugs interact and uh, the, uh, the requirements for nutrients changes. So I just thought I'd show you a little picture here. I hope you can see that. It's a picture of my mum uh, a few years ago. She's dancing with some broccoli. Um, and I like this picture. I always feel reassured about her folate intake. Um, but um, <coughs> I'll come back to that later on. And so I'm going to start just by looking at these changes in body composition. So really quite marked. As we get older, we lose muscle mass, we lose uh, bone mineral, and we gain fat. And it's a little bit um, uh, disguised at times. And so someone who's maintained the, the same body weight throughout their adult life um, may still be quite different in body composition. They will have less muscle and more fat. And where the body is will be in a different place. And so we tend to accumulate fat around our torso uh, and lose muscle around our limbs. So this is my diagram of body composition. And so that bone loss um, can lead to osteoporosis. Um, and so that's where there's less bone mineral and the bones have become uh, fragile. Often it's not appreciated until someone has a fall and has a fracture. The muscle loss, um, and that is easier to determine because it can result in a change of muscle function and muscle strength. So things, normal things, or things that had been usual in uh, normal in earlier life, like taking the lid off a jam jar, um, can be a great challenge. Um, and then there's a gain in fat. Now, generally, people don't have one or the other. And so there's combinations of bone loss and muscle loss. And so sarcopenic um, uh, obesity can occur when there's um, a combination of the three together. Um, and the tissues are not inert. They're not sort of staying in their separate compartments. They're interfering with each other. So when fat is gained, 
um, it will uh, recompartmentalize and that fat cells will be deposited in bone tissue or in muscle tissue and change the function of those tissues. Um, and what the fat also does is produce inflammatory cytokines. And there's quite a convincing argument that what the process of aging is, is a process of increased inflammation and a higher level of inflammatory signals that are produced. And so, um, generally, uh, as people get older, they acquire a state of chronic low-grade inflammation. And so things like inflammatory signals are maintained um, at a higher level. And that's associated with some of the pathogenesis of age-related diseases. So, aging um, and then the inflammation associated with aging has, been, uh, has acquired the name of inflammaging or inflammaging. Um, and uh, a number of those age-related diseases, chronic diseases, are associated with the inflammation. The things that cause the inflammation, um, some of them are related to having been around longer, so having a greater exposure to things like uh, pathogens or having a greater number of cells that have acquired cellular debris. Um, and so just cells functioning not quite normally, um, not being got rid of appropriately, being exposed to stress for a longer period of time. And then on my next line, I've put the things which are potentially modifiable. So things like oxidative damage and adiposity, um, uh, dysbiosis, where the gut microbiota change in profile and become less optimal for good health, uh, and lifestyle changes, they're things that are potentially modifiable. We can do something about We can cut, reduce our smoking, uh, reduce alcohol intake, alter oxidative damage by increasing the level, uh, the intake of um, antioxidant nutrients like selenium and vitamin C. So, um, <laughs> so that's... Um, uh, almost my last general slide before moving on to the nutrients. The very last one is um, to consider the gut microbiota. So up in the top right corner, the age-related diseases, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, cardiovascular disease like heart disease and stroke, um, and depression and dementia. So the gut microbiota... Um, uh, we used to consider, or I don't know whether we did consider at all, we just used to ignore um, the gut microbiota um, and just not really take any notice of it. And we've moved to the opposite extreme, and that's understanding that there's no physiological system that isn't affected by the gut microbiota, and that those microorganisms that are predominantly in, in the colon um, are very much affected by the diet we consume. So if we get older and we make dietary changes, these might be economically driven or den dentally driven, all sorts of changes. Or as um, our gut gets older and digestion changes uh, and absorption perhaps is altered, what will get to those gut microbiota is different. And that will affect then which ones thrive and which ones um, are not receiving enough substrate for, those, for their own need. And that changes the gut microbiota. And so that gut microbiota will influence things like inflammation. Um, if we've got more of one type than another type, the metabolites and signals that they produce can alter. Um, and the gut barrier function uh, can change, and so it might let more things across. And in doing so, the interaction with those substances and these uh, immune cells um, can be altered. And so if you look at the gut microbiota, um, they have an impact on everything. One of the things that's currently of uh, interest is how vaccination responses change. Um, and they are different in older people, and there is an association, um, not because it's too early to say, with COVID vaccination, but with other vaccinations and people's age. Now, I'm going to move on now to talk about the nutrients of interest, and I'm afraid it's really biased. It's kind of 
the nutrients that I'm currently interested in. Um, so, and the reason for this is, by definition, nutrients are es essential in our life. If we don't get enough of them, we'll have a deficiency disorder. If it gets worse, we'll die. Um, and for many of them, if we have too many of the nutrient, too much of the nutrients, that will also create a problem. And so I could pick any of the nutrients and talk to you about them and talk about ageing. But the ones I've picked are the ones um, that I'm particularly interested in. And that's because there's either uh, a different recommendation for people as they get older, or I think there should be. Um, and the one I'm going to start with um, is protein. And it presents quite an interesting case about the resistance to making change to recommendation. So if we look at sarcopenia, there's a relationship with protein. And so sarcopenia is the loss of muscle mass and the associated function, so strength. Um, and um, if you look at what happens when people get older, they lose muscle mass, whatever they do, and so we can look at the best possible diet in someone having the best level of activity, I don't know, a 90-year-old marathon runner. That marathon runner will still have some sarcopenia. Um, if protein intake is compromised, there will be a greater level of loss of muscle. And so sarcopenia is worsened if there's a low intake of protein. Is this, if there's a low level of activity, whatever someone's age, they will lose muscle mass. And so this is a big problem for astronauts going into space, sitting around, um, and I think possibly being a, a long-haul astronaut in a space capsule is right at the extreme of sedentary activity in someone who is potentially active. Um, they will lose muscle. This is why we see them being wheeled out of the space capsules when they get back to Earth. And so, um, so it's inevitable. However good the diet, um, however good the level of activity, there will be a loss of muscle. But with a higher level of protein intake, that loss of muscle can be um, lessened. And so it's abrogated... Um, uh, and, and so I've just got some pictures across the bottom, which I hope you can see. Me looking this way, they look a little bit faded. They're slightly better you looking this way. <laughs> um, so if you look at the first diagram here, there's a young uh, male and uh, uh, an older male, and the, it's an artist's impression, they match. Um, and if we were to put a tape measure around the triceps and biceps muscle, we'd probably find the same circumference. But what's different is that the internal muscle layer will be less in the older person, and there'll be more fat to compensate for that. And you can see here um, a cross-section of the little circles, the bone, of muscle, and then surrounded by fat, and how that varies. But the, the overall diameter is approximately the same. Um, and the diagram on the right shows muscle mass or muscle strength. And so it's quite difficult to measure muscle mass, but it's quite easy to measure muscle strength. You can give people um, a little gauge to squeeze, and that dynamometer will measure um, the strength that they can generate from their arm muscles. And so these measurements are fairly easy to do. And we see that it peaks in early adulthood, and then it starts to drop off and decline. And so down here, in that uh, later part of the decline, is where there's marked sarcopenia, and things like gait and balance um, will be affected. So, um, that strength and performance then can be maintained for longer if there's enough protein. And so, if there's sarcopenia, the muscle mass will go, and we'll measure some of those functional outcomes, the strength, fatigue, um, and really the ability to maintain balance is so important because it relates to um, the, the age effects of aging on bone. And so if, you could, if somebody is more likely to get their hands out in front of them as they trip, 
and they've got enough strength in their arms, they'll break the fall and they're less likely to fall um, and break a bone. So the muscle and bone go very tightly together. So this sarcopenia then, inevitable in ageing, but if we look at the research studies where people consume a higher level of protein, they can slow that loss of muscle down and indeed, particularly the protein intake is associated with exercise, increase their level of muscle mass. So, the question is, what is the right amount of protein and why, don't, why is there resistance to um, uh, changing the recommendation? So at the moment, for adults, we recommend 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. And so someone who's bigger, more kilograms, will have a higher protein recommendation. It's not perfect. It would be better to make that recommendation for lean body mass rather than total body mass. Um, but generally, you can weigh weight very easily. If you look at the research studies, increasing it from 0.8 grams per, per kilogram to 1, or 1.2, or 1.6, which is doubling it, has a positive effect on ma maintenance of muscle mass. Um, and so the, it seems obvious that the, a good thing to do would be to increase the recommendation for protein intake. But if you do that, and say you go to an extreme and double the protein recommendation, the, the jury is not out about what the precise amount of protein would be optimal. Um, it means that all of a sudden, overnight, as that decision is made, there will be a huge increase in the number of people who are classified as protein deficient. Um, and there is such a lot of government pullback about making a change of a nutrient recommendation because overnight, the number who are deficient, who are malnourished, has gone up and then there's a need to do something about it. So it's a lot of resistance for any nutrient to make a recommendation change. If you look at how we eat protein, um, we often have a couple of meals a day which have got a higher um, level of protein than the other food we consume. If you want to get to um, a higher protein intake, it means really that you need to consider the protein in every meal, every beverage and every snack and look at ways of increasing that. Um, and so there is some resistance to change. There's also some interesting research about whether certain proteins containing perhaps a different balance of amino acids might have a, a bigger impact on uh, pr protein synthesis particularly following exercise. So, that's protein. My recommendation is that if you want to look at the quality of a meal or consider nutrition of a person, you can just focus on the protein. Um, it's my recommendation for all sorts of things, for small children who don't want to eat, which part of your meal has got the protein in, eat that bit. Um, but there. So I'm going to move on from here to looking at bone and osteoporosis um, and the calcium recommendations. And so we tend to focus on peak bone mass. So this is the most bone mass you'll ever have. And it is reached at somewhere at the end of the, the, when people are in their 20s, so maybe somewhere between 25 and 35, they'll reach peak bone mass. And it's interesting, because that's often a time when people are not bothered at all about their bone mass. You know, osteoporosis, fractures, the things that happens to other people. It's very difficult for young people to consider um, what will happen in 50 years' time. Um, and so they tend not to do very much about it when they could. Um, and what will happen is that it will stay roughly plateaued um, for young adult life, and then it declines. And there's a really marked rate of decline in bone mass that occurs in women uh, for about five years post-menopause. Um, and then it continues to decline. And we look at this and we kind of think, ah, oh, I've missed getting the peak and increasing my peak. 
um, of bone mass. But what we can still do is slow the rate of decline down um, or indeed increase bone mass. And so <laughs> there is a kind of concept, and I notice I do quite a lot of DEXA scans at Massey, um, it's a concept that the manufacturers of the DEXA scanning machines have, and that's that the only people who will ever need to have their bone mass measured are little old ladies. Um, and this is that the bed that the people lie on is really small. It's short and it's narrow. And we should really be concerned about bone mass in all people, all ethnicities, um, all genders, um, and uh, uh, all ages. So, as the bone mass declines, the structure of the bone is changing from the top diagram, a kind of quite neat, close-knit honeycomb, to the bottom diagram, where there starts to be quite discernible holes in the tissue when we look at the microarchitecture. Um, and I find this interesting because it, it almost looks like a grid of vertical lines, um, sorry, vertical lines and horizontal lines. Um, and there's a characteristic observation that the vertical architecture looks stronger than the horizontal one. And so bones can be quite fragile, but people can remain standing and walking around because the bone structure is strong going in this direction. But once they fall, that impact will have an impact on sideways, so on um, the horizontal structure of the architecture. So um, as the bone becomes more fragile because bone mass is lost, um, the impact of a fall is more likely to lead to a fracture. Uh, and there's... Um, a fracture is often the first sign that there's anything untoward with the bone structure and there's a drop in bone and mineral density. Um, there's quite a lot that can be done outside of nutrition, so doing things to uh, reduce the possibility or the probability of a fall. So things like, I think about this a lot, I'm a very messy person, not leaving things lying around on the floor that you could fall over, having um, uh, the house uh, fracture-proofed, which means things like having light switches in the right place, not having to walk a long way before you find a light switch. And those are the sorts of things that ACC has pushed. Um, but bone tissue is dynamic. It carries on, its metabolism is ongoing, even though when we measure the net composition of bone, we can talk about bone tending to go down in mass um, during life. What we see is that you can stimulate more bone tissue to be laid down. So this is um, a picture of the bone cells that are involved in maintaining um, bone mineral. And there's the cells um, on the left. They look a little bit like Pac-Man. They kind of come in and secrete digestive enzymes and dissolve minerals um, and cause bone resorption. And then the osteoblasts are the cells that will lay down bone. And what happens in older age is there tends to be an imbalance. And so rather than bone loss equaling bone accretion, um, bone loss will be greater than bone formation, and so that there's a net loss of bone. Uh, but if you put stress on bone, and the way to put stress on a bone um, is to pull on it, and you pull on it by pulling, doing activity so that the muscles are pulling on different parts of the bone and stimulating uh, uh, the, blastus, the osteoblasts to, to lay down uh, bone tissue. And as people get older, um, they will uh, absorb less calcium and um, the loss in urine is increased. The loss goes up and the absorption goes down. And so this is the reason why calcium recommendations go up um, in 
uh, for older people. And so for women over 50, the calcium recommendation has gone up from 1,000 milligrams a day to 1,300. So that's an increase of about um, a third again, so 30 percent, is a really significant increase. Uh, and it's difficult to do on the same diet um, as the diet that was providing 1,000 milligrams. And for everybody over 70, men and women, the recommendation for calcium is higher. Now, I was going to um, just um, talk about the reasons why. So there's the, the drop in absorption, but also the um, increase in loss in the urine. But what there is also is a change in vitamin D. And so uh, most of the vitamin D um, in younger people comes from themselves. It's what they synthesize in their skin when that skin is exposed to UV light. So as we get older, um, skin is not so good at synthesizing vitamin D. The precursor that's going to be converted to vitamin D is there's not so much made and the ability to convert that precursor to the active form of vitamin D um, is also decreased. And so what we would expect is that if someone went out in the sun and exposed uh, a certain um, area of their skin to UV light, they would increase their vitamin D synthesis. But a 70-year-old will only make about 20% of what that person would have made when they were 20, exposing exactly the same area to exactly the same level of light. So it's really quite a significant drop in vitamin D synthesis that occurs with age. Um, and so what we would think is then eat more. Eat more foods that are rich in vitamin D. And our problem is, is there's not very much that offers rich sources of vitamin D. So salmon is a good source of vitamin D. Cod liver oil is. Um, I grew up in the UK at a time where before we could go to school in the morning, we had to line up at the door and be fed our teaspoon of cod liver oil. And anyone not doing that would have their head tipped back and their nose pinched. And when they screamed out, the cod liver oil would go in. Um, it's a good source of vitamin D. Um, but it's not usual in our diet. And if we look at fish consumption, uh, fish consumption in New Zealand, is, it's slightly difficult to be sure about because some people, like Graham, will go out and fish. And um, that self-caught fish is often not reported. Um, and the bought fish is expensive. And so we tend to get people split into people who can afford to eat and buy fish and people who don't eat much at all. So vitamin D then um, uh, potentially um, more important in the diet as we get older because our skin's not so good at synthesizing it. Um, and so it's prescribed. Um, it's vitamin D is the 12th most frequent prescription in New Zealand. Um, uh, so it's a common prescription. And it's prescribed on the basis of likely risk. And so um, frail older people will be prescribed vitamin D and anyone thought to be at risk. So for instance, someone who's been advised not to go in the sun because they've had a history of skin cancer. The vitamin D tests are expensive and the vitamin D itself isn't. And so it means that testing is not common, but prescriptions occur on a guess um, of risk. It's become of greater interest because it doesn't just affect absorption of calcium from the diet. It's also thought um, to affect not only bone mineralization, but muscle function um, and immune function and all sorts of other things, including cellular differentiation and the likelihood of cancer developing. So in some data sets, there's very clear mapping of cancers to latitude, and that latitude is, reflects the amount of UV light that there is. And so you see 
um, at more extreme latitude where there's less UV light, higher prevalence of certain cancers. Um, and the muscle function aspect is really important. Um, and so muscle strength is associated with vitamin D. Uh, I um, know somebody who works in the UK uh, with adolescent girls who are covered for religious reasons, so they don't, their skin doesn't see the sun. And there they have a lot of problems with muscle strength. And so you can drop um, something on the floor and ask them to pick it up, and they struggle if they're vitamin D deficient. And then after a short time on vitamin D supplementation, they um, can time the time it takes to pick the thing from the ground, and it's much faster because of that change. Um, in muscle function. So I've talked about calcium and vitamin D, and I'd like to kind of diverge just a little bit and talk about lactose intolerance. And so people of European ancestry are the peculiar group of people who continue to express the enzyme that breaks down lactose in adult life. And so they can continue to consume dairy products um, after childhood. And so there will be many of us here for whom that's the case, um, because we're of Northern European ancestry. Um, most people in the world can't. Um, so, but that lactose tolerance, that, ex that expression of the enzyme that will break down lactose drops off with increasing age. So by the time people get um, into their fifth decade, so they're somewhere above 40, the expression of lac lactase, the enzyme, will start to drop off. And this means that um, we start to see the beginning of lactose intolerance. But it's gradual. And so a lactose intolerance test, which is awful, um, because you give something to somebody, a huge amount of lactose, to people who are being tested because they have a problem with digesting it. Uh, and so it's a really unpopular test because it will create extreme symptoms because they're usually reporting a problem with lactose intolerance to a little bit of lactose rather than a lot. And the uh, symptoms, things like um, gas and bloating and diarrhea and pain, can be extreme from a lactose intolerance test. But in real life, um, we tend particularly as adults, not to consume a lot of lactose in our diet. And so if we glug down um, a couple of glasses of milk, that's a lot of lactose. But generally, we might put that milk in tea or in breakfast cereal and not consume a lot at once. And the other thing is that when uh, people are lactose intolerant, they can consume dairy products where the lactose has already been removed. And it might have been removed as part, for instance, of making cheese. And so the way, because lactose is a sugar, is in the soluble fraction that's thrown away um, or discarded for some other purpose uh, when the cheese is made. And so cheese will still contain calcium, um, but not lactose. Uh, and so it's easily tolerated. And likewise, yogurt, um, the bacteria, the lactobacilli that make the yogurt have used that lactose. And so us usually lac yogurt is uh, an acceptable dairy food for people who might be lactose intolerant to a glass of milk. So... I'm going to just touch upon a couple of things before I finish. The first is um, iron absorption. Most of my um, research has been associated with iron absorption. The little diagram at the top represents heme iron that comes from meat, muscle, um, and in blood. And generally, there is no change or issue um, with absorption of iron from heme iron. Um, and so much so that we don't even bother to do much research into it because people who eat meat are unlikely to get iron deficiency. Um, and so, this is going backwards, let's take that bit off. <laughs> um, and so, most of the iron that we consume comes from non-heme iron, 
And mostly in the environment, it's in the form of Fe3+, a so trivalent metal, um, which beneficially is not easily absorbed. Beneficially, because iron, um, if it was too well absorbed, would be extremely toxic. So a small amount of the iron we consume, Fe3+, will be converted into Fe2+. And that divalent metal is what can be shipped into the enterocyte of the gut. Um, and that's where the first change occurs with age. And that's that that transformation conversion of Fe3+, the insoluble predominant form of iron, to Fe2+, the less common but absorbable form, um, is governed by the level of acid. And a lot of that is controlled by the, the level of acidity in the stomach. And as we get older, we produce less gastric acid. And so that conversion to a form that can be absorbed um, is less efficient. Um, and then the rate at which cells divide um, slows down as we get older. So I talk to my students about how they can tell I'm older than them, and that's because I've got more wrinkles. Um, and my gut is the same. The rate of mitosis, tissue repair, is slower in my gut as well as in my skin. So my gut is also slightly compromised. Um, and so that decrease in the rate of cell division also means absorption's not so good with increased age. Um, now, that's got the iron in, so it's come in through this little transporter here, the divalent metal transporter, into the middle of the cell, and in the cell it'll either be stored or it'll be shipped out into the bloodstream. And that export of iron is controlled by a transporter here, it's green, uh, called ferroportin. Now, life is about a battle between pathogens and the host. So I'm the host and the pathogens are the things that might do me harm. And so the um, evolution or evolutionary adaptation that keeps the iron available for me and not for the pathogens is that if there's any sign of inflammation or infection, um, my liver will produce more hepcidin and that hepcidin will cause the iron exporter, ferroportin, to go into the cell and not do anything. And so that means the iron that I absorb will stay in my gut cell and it won't be released for the pathogens that require iron as well. And so that's a really slick um, adaptation that means that while the immune cells are working on how to destroy the pathogen, the gut cells are controlling the release of iron and stopping it being available for the pathogens to thrive on. And so it's very neat, but what happens with inflammation um, is that as we get older, that inflammation that I talked about means that there's a higher level of hepcidin. And so there will be much more um, hepcidin here that will interact and stop the export of the iron that's been absorbed from the gut cells from those cells into the bloodstream. Um, and so, and one of the things to think about, which is that obesity is an inflammatory condition. So we're talking about inflammation here possibly being associated with high levels of body fat and people who've got more hepcidin um, not getting enough iron uh, to make their red blood cells. So if we consider iron then, there's all sorts of things that could compromise the the iron status. The first, if there's insufficient dietary iron. Um, and this can be an insufficient amount, or it could be that it's a, an okay amount, but from a diet that's got a high level of inhibitors. And then absorption will be impaired because the iron is bound to the inhibiting substance and going through the gut rather than being available for being absorbed. The Next consideration is gut bleeding, and gut bleeding can occur all throughout the gut, um, and that might occur because there's gastritis um, damage to the lining of the stomach, um, which is causing a little bit of blood 
um, to be consistently lost. Uh, it could be worse, it could be an ulcer, it could be a big lesion. Um, and so blood loss um, in the gut, the gut is prone to losing blood. Um, and then there's malabsorption. And uh, one of the most interesting um, gut pathogens is Helicobacter pylori. It looks like uh, a little helicopter. Um, and it comes in and it hijacks the gut cells. And so it's very tolerant to um, the acid environment of the stomach, but it would prefer it slightly less. And so it comes in and it takes over the, um, some of the functioning of the cells that produce acid and suppress acid production, which is good for the growth of the helicobacter. Um, but that will have an impact on that conversion of Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. Um, and then other inflammatory conditions will have a similar effect. Um, and there are some drugs that will also have an impact. So proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers, which are taken by people who have a reflux and the acid is moving from the stomach into the esophagus and causing pain, um, that will have a net impact on the conversion of Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. And so there'll be less absorbable iron. Um, and very commonly, for all sorts of reasons, aspirin is recommended. Just small dose aspirin, and it might be recommended for all sorts of reasons. So to affect coagulation, or for pain relief, um, or um, to reduce inflammatory conditions in osteoarthritis. And so it's very common for people to take a regular um, low-dose aspirin for a long time. And so my favourite broccoli dancer that we saw earlier um, had uh, took low-dose aspirin for a very long time, and it wasn't until she couldn't climb steps in the hospital to see um, her new granddaughter that it was appreciated that um, She'd got quite marked anemia. And because it's a low-dose aspirin, causing a little bleed and a little loss of blood, a little loss of iron, uh, the body adapts to it. And so it can get quite severe uh, before it becomes evident. So there's iron. Um, and <coughs> I mentioned very briefly um, B vitamins. And so the one that is of most concern in older people is vitamin B12. And there might be a compromised status because there's a low intake. Um, it only comes from animal-sourced foods. It could be that there's a problem with saliva production. So xerostomia um, is where there'll be less saliva. And that saliva is going to break down B12 um, from the food matrix that it's consumed in and also provide it with another um, uh, component that it can bind to and then travel in the gut. And um, lower down in the stomach, if the parietal cells that produce the intrinsic factor that B12 needs to bind to to be absorbed are damaged, and we get people who have both antibodies to those cells and damage occurring to those cells, or antibodies that recognize the factor itself, that will affect um, absorption in the lower gut. And so B12 deficiency, fairly common, but very um, diffuse symptoms. And in fact, there's some quite interesting similarities between the symptoms of B12 deficiency and multiple sclerosis. And so that loss of um, nerve uh, control. So I numbered my slides. My students like slides numbered because it's kind of pacing themselves through. Um, we've got 19 is my last one, and this is 17. Um, so the two cycles that we're particularly interested in associated with B vitamins are the folate cycle and the methionine cycle. And they interact. Bits of one cycle go into the other cycle. And feeding in, we've got protein, amino acids, including methionine, which goes into the methionine cycle, and folate. Folate is B vitamin. It's named for the same root as foliage, so it comes from green leafy things. Broccoli is very rich in um, folate. 
Um, and coming out of those cycles are the raw ingredients to make DNA that will be needed for every cell division, plus um, uh, components that will have uh, an effect on oxidation. Um, and very importantly, the methionine cycle produces a methyl group. It's just a CH3 group, and that gets stuck onto various components of DNA that are going to control gene expression. And so everything any cell does is affected by these one carbon units that are produced from the methionine cycle. So um, that leads me into considering redox status. And so we make free radicals. Every time one of our white blood cells engulfs a pathogen, um, ready to kill it, it will kill it by generating an oxidative burst that will um, use free radicals in a controlled way to kill. Um, perfect. But our problem comes when there's an imbalance generally and there's free radicals that aren't working positively for the outcome of the body. Um, and there, there can be an imbalance, and so oxidative damage can occur. Um, and that oxidative damage can damage DNA or cell membranes um, or lipids. It can be quite uncontrolled and cause the damage, but it's kept in check um, by our intake, particularly of antioxidant nutrients like vitamin C um, and some of the phytochemicals, selenium and so on. And those antioxidants have an impact on everything. Um, and so they have an impact on the gut microbiota. Um, and they also provide some protection to cognitive decline and cardiovascular health. So this kind of leads to um, the question that my friend in the front row will ask, what do we eat now? And our answer is, we don't really know. Um, we do know that there are, there are some things that are harmful, um, but generally, we don't go to a supermarket and say, I'm going to go and have on your list, um, I'm going to go and buy some vitamin C and selenium. I do know people who do this. Um, I'm going to buy some selenium. I'm going to buy some vitamin C. We go to buy food. Um, and so an alternative approach, rather than looking at isolated nutrients, is to say, what sort of diets are associated with the best health? And all sorts of answers come back to those questions, come back to the same thing. And that's that a Mediterranean style diet is associated with optimal bone health or optimal gut health, optimal cardiovascular health. Um, we have to call it a Mediterranean style diet now because we've got, um, my colleagues and I at Massey got smacked for calling it a Mediterranean diet. Um, because we're not very close to the Mediterranean. Uh, but it's got the same similarities, uh, which is interesting, because we've probably got similar physiology to the people who live in the Mediterranean. So it's rich in olive oil, rich um, in fruit and vegetables, soluble fiber, nuts, uh, very rich in folate. Um, and so this is the, the diet. And for those of you who've been to the UK in the last decade or so, you may notice my um, pictures. Uh, they're the work of Emma Dibden, who is employed by, or sort of contracted to Waitrose, the supermarket, for producing their illustrations. And Emma has kindly given me permission to show these, which I feel has enhanced the slides no end. Um, so I was going to finish by asking if you've got any questions and to thank Emma for allowing me to use her illustrations. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, an hour ago, I thought I was fit and healthy. I now realize I'm a walking battleground. And I'm <laughs> just going down. It's walking that's the key uh, thing. Uh, Think of the okay, muscle keep, and keep bone. Going. <laughs> OK. Uh, question. I see one hand up there. I think there's going to be quite a few, but we'll work our way around. Um, in a way, it's two questions, but you might only want to answer one now. Um, one was that you mentioned epigenetics, but you didn't say any more about it, and I was interested in yeah. what characteristics they were talking about. The other thing, though, is that something that a lot of women who 
have got low density um, because of osteoporosis, have been tasting, taking Fosamex for a long time. I'm now taking something a bit different, which I'm told 60% of Australian women take, called Dinosumeb. And for the first time ever, I have seen an increase in bone density with two, two yearly things. So I wondered if you wanted to say something yeah. about what people do about it. So the, the first bit about epigenetics is if you look at the DNA in any cell, there's bits of it that are silenced. And as we go through life, what we're exposed to um, will affect which of our genes are silenced. And so if you were to take identical twins at birth, um, because they've been through the same experiences in utero, they would have very similar genes silenced or switched on, so their epigenetic profile would be very similar. Now, the, their DNA is the same, um, but as they moved away from home and did different things, their epigenetics would start to change because they'd be exposed to different things. So everything we do... Um, influences our epigenetics. And when we talk about those genes being switched on or silenced, it's the methyl groups coming from those cycles that are providing the, I guess, the building blocks of, cell sil of DNA silencing and epigenetics, switching some bits off or switching them on. Now, the other thing about the drugs, the bisphosphonates, um, they work well. They have uh, an impact on the cells involved in keeping that balance between bone resorption and bone formation. Um, they're often uh, come with side effects, um, and so there can be some quite marked gut side effects. Um, and I think the general nutritional approach is not to offer nutrient advice instead of a medication, but to uh, make suggestions for nutrition to be an adjunct, for things to work back to better, for the level of drug that's required to be less. Um, and it's really difficult with bone density because it will go down. This is just, if you live long enough, you will get osteoporosis. It's better than the alternative. Um, so it will go down, and so you'll see something at one measurement, and it will be lower at the next measurement, but it's the speed at which it's going down. Is it going down sharply, or is the dietary change or the drug slowing the rate at which it goes down? So even when there is no positive change, bone mass going up, it still can be a positive outcome because it's going down less. Very good. Wonderful but not altogether everyone's experience. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, metabolic rate, how to raise it? I feel like we would all be healthier, more energetic, more, 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 if we could do something about metabolic rate. Um, more, more muscle will raise it, so muscle cells are quite energetically expensive to run. Um, but because there are these changes, it, it will go down. Um, so it will go down, but it can go down less if you can keep muscle up. So if you look at, I don't know, say a, a myocyte, a muscle cell, and what it does compared to an adipocyte, a fat cell, the muscle cell is more metabolically active. It's um, responding to insulin in a different way. It's very beneficial to have more muscle. This, last week, when the speaker started, she thanked people for coming because the weather was so bad. I feel I should be thanking you even more for coming because the weather is so good. You should be outside, moving around, getting the muscle mass up, synthesizing some vitamin D. Um, this, <laughs> But thank you for being here. <laughs> With the nutritional value in tinned foods, as in salmon, beetroot? Yes, absolutely. So 
we, we tend to have a concept of um, fresh food, freshly cooked food being better, but it's all got nutritional value. And I keep coming back to my time in my childhood in the UK, where Brussels sprouts were boiled until they became liquid. Um, very little nutritional value there, but in a tinned Brussels sprout, very much more. So the manufacturers have gone to a lot of work to optimise um, the palatability of the food, but also l looking at nutrient loss in when they can things and so on. So, and the phytochemicals will still be there in the tinned beetroot, tinned fish bones. Jane, you mentioned meals, snacks, and drinks. Yes. How frequently should older people be consuming food? And would you have any um, comment to make about the amount that you would have at each of those times? So it, it's really variable. So some people find it difficult to tolerate a larger meal, particularly if there's problems, for instance, with a reflux um, uh, or a hernia. Um, and then it's better to split into more... I guess I'd probably at that point not talk about meals and snacks, but a much higher frequency of meals. Um, I do have a little bit of reservation about... Um, the high protein drinks and that's the protein tends to suppress appetite and so my recommendation would therefore be to have a high protein drink after a normal meal rather than before a meal where intake could be compromised um, so I don't think there is a generic recommendation but I think the recommendation to ensure that the snack and the beverage nutrient load is considered is, is a good thing to think about What do you think about the idea of a fasting window in the day? Lately I've been hearing about recommendations for only eating within an eight hour window. Yeah. Um, a lot of the recommendations are targeted towards people trying to lose weight. And my recommendation um, for people as they get older is not to weigh yourself. Um, it's, it's Bathroom scales are really good for weighing puppies um, and for checking the weight of a suitcase before you travel. <laughs> but the rest of the time, I think the quality of the diet is more important um, and the health, someone behaving in a healthy way, whatever their weight, um, can be healthier than somebody who's got a lot of body fat but is low total weight. There are some interesting changes in metabolism that occur in the circadian rhythm throughout the 24-hour period. But um, generally, I think the recommendations are harnessed towards losing kilograms rather than maximising health. Um, uh, this lactose intolerance, yeah. I, I thought I w it wasn't me, but lately taking up and even trying the A2 milk, Yes, a glass of milk upsets me. Uh, could you tell me a bit? Oh, so I, I do have yogurt, uh, so I'll make my own. The, um, can you tell me about the cheese again? Did you, would you say that yeah. all cheese so is, is uh, all right because the lactose is taken out of it? Hard cheese. Sorry? So it's hard cheese. Oh. So you separate. What happens to the milk is that the protein is precipitated, and so you get a solid mass of protein. I'm sure there's people in the audience who are much better able to talk about cheese making than me. Um, you get a solid mass of protein that will have the calcium associated with it and the bit that's discarded will contain the whey protein, the liquid and anything that's water soluble like the lactose. So hard cheese is often better tolerated and the, the milk that you're drinking by the glass you might get on better with if you took it is two half-sized glasses with a bit of a gap between, um, just not all at once. <laughs>
You mentioned the issue of uh, boiling Brussels sprouts and the problems with it. But in general, with, with food, like with uh, meat, if you want the iron and so on, are there differences, whether it's, uh, uh, or fish as well, if it's fried as opposed to steamed or, or roast or whatever? For iron that, particularly? Well, well, uh, in, in ge well, that's one. But in general with food, are there certain rules? Frying food is not so good or something like that? Uh. I think it depends. <laughs> I'm not going to give a straightforward answer. It, it really depends what the food is. And so if you look at something in tomato, it, the, t lycopene, it's a, a phytochemical that it is protective. It's a good thing. But the availability of lycopene is much higher from a pizza than it is from a tomato. Um, and that's because it's fat-soluble and it's been exposed to heat and it's been released. And so it will be in the, pe the tomato topping of the pizza are much more bioavailable than eating a raw tomato. If you fry that tomato, you, you get more out of it. Um, and there's, there's lots of questions about this. So meat is quite a tricky one because the iron in the meat is in the form of heme iron and also non-heme iron. And the, the way it's cooked or prepared or stored uh, prior perhaps to you even getting it will affect whether there's some breakdown of that heme iron. Um, so, uh, the recommendation, diversity, eat different things, cook them in different ways. <laughs> That's such a perfect answer, isn't it? <laughs> Complete cop-out. <laughs> I'll throw in frozen food. If you cook meals and then freeze them and eat them later, are they...? Uh... Fine, fine. My biggest worry there would be food safety and making sure that you don't leave them hanging around too long in a place where they could get some nasty pathogens lurking around. Okay, uh, any more questions? Uh, okay, well, well Jane, I'd, I'd like, on behalf of them... Can I just... Yes. So, there are some experts here, laughing in the front row, experts in meat, experts in food preparation and making cheese. Um, harness your group. <laughs> Sorry, Stuart. No, that, that, that's <laughs> fine. I, I, I'd just like to say, though, on behalf of everybody, and uh, uh, first, a, a big thank you to Crossroads Church, because this is being live streamed to YouTube, as, as you know, and it will be available permanently on the, on the link site. Now, you, you've given, in, in, in my opinion, something that was absolutely packed with lots of information. Some of it could be technical and we could follow up a lot further, but it was comprehensible by a general audience, which is uh, not something we always expect from, from academics. So I'd really like to thank you very much, Jane. And uh, I, I think I've learned a lot, and I think I can go back and review this and actually pick up a lot more. So thank you very much. Your preparation has been excellent. Thanks on. And uh, on behalf of you 3A, I would like to give you, again, a, a little token. And, and I would say also, Jane was uh, uh, significant in the motivation of the theme for this series and actually in helping get together the group of speakers. So uh, we've got a great supporter and contribution there. So thank you very much indeed. Next week, we have, uh, again, a speaker from the last series, Johan Potgeiter on robotics for geriatrics. The robots are coming. I'm sure he'll have a stimulating uh, talk with lots of interesting examples. We hope we see you here, or if not here, then uh, watching online. Okay, thank you very much for coming, everybody, and uh, see you next week. <laughs>